what are some of the common threads that you've identified in hyper successful driven people? So it's actually there are four of them. And it really didn't matter if you were the Nobel Prize winning scientist or if you were the Olympic champion. It was the same four things. And I think you're you're going to recognize them in yourself as well. So the first one is what we call intrinsic motivation, which is very different from extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is that fire in your belly, right? When you talk to someone and their whole face lights up, mm -hmm. they have tapped into their intrinsic motivation. It's the reason you get up in the morning. It's the reason you can't quiet your mind at night. It's what you would do for free if you could. That's intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is you do it for the awards, rewards, bonuses, Olympic medal, right? If you're doing it for those reasons, that's other people judging you. That's extrinsic motivation. If other people judge you, you can't sustain that. So what's going to happen is you will fail out or burn out. So tapping into your intrinsic motivation is one of the most important parts. That's number one. Ready for number two? Yeah. <laughs> Please. So num number two is how you approach challenges. So yeah, it's your work ethic, your perseverance, your grit, all of those sexy words. Really what it means, it's not about working 18, 20 hours a day. That's not what it's about. It's about what you're doing during those hours, how you're doing it, and how it is that you are approaching challenges. So look at all the Olympic athletes. They trained for the 2020 Olympics, and then a pandemic comes along. And the Olympics are postponed for a year. But most Olympians did not back out, say, I'm not doing this for another year. I'm not training. Most of them actually continued to train. They found a way to do it, right? They can't meet with their trainer. They went outside. They did a Zoom. They did what they needed to do. They never question if they'll overcome a challenge. They know that they will. Instead, they focus on how. What is the challenge I haven't thought of yet? And adding that word yet as you approach a challenge completely changes the trajectory because now you are in the driver's seat. That puts you in charge. And that's why they don't give up when they get a failure, when they get a rejection, when a, a manuscript is rejected, when an experiment doesn't work. This is why they keep going. And the definition the of one. practice, right? When I think of a like meditation practice, a yoga practice, it is sometimes we don't think about it for you know, the long-term process of training, let's say, for the Olympics. But, you know, you do call it, let's go to practice. But it's this longer-term sustained approach to development, right? Yeah, makes, makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the third one, what worked for you early in your career, you have to continue doing that. You can never rest on your laurels. You have to go back to those foundational techniques so one of the people who I interviewed was Neil Katyal. Neil Katyal, you probably see him on the news all the time. He has argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court of the United States, more than any other minority lawyer. And I said, Neil, what do you do to prep for these cases? I mean, it's the Supreme Court of the United States. And he said the same three things. He said he prepares a binder that has the answer to every possible question that he might get asked. And he walks into the Supreme Court and puts that binder on the table in front of him. He said in 45 cases, he's never once opened that binder. But just the practice of preparing it actually prepares him for the case. The second thing he does are moot courts. They're like simulated court environments. He said he does five of them before every case. And he said he's been doing that since his first case, moot courts, over and over and over again. And last but not least, if you are Neil Katyal's children, the night before the opening arguments of the case, your bedtime story becomes the opening arguments. <laughs> because he said if children can understand it, the court will understand it. And he has done that same exact practice for each of those 45 cases. He doesn't say, oh, I've done this before. I don't need to do moot courts. I don't need that whole binder. I don't need to simplify it so a child can understand it. He does it over and over and over again. And last but not least, and this is the one that surprised me the most. You've heard of the billionaires, Mark Cuban and Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. They are notorious for reading three to eight hours a day. But it's not reading that made them 
so successful. It's opening their minds up to new knowledge. So they do it by reading, but how can the rest of us do it, right? So sure, we can read books, but maybe we have the time or the bandwidth or the attention for something shorter, such as articles. Or maybe we like watching webinars, such as the summit that went on. Or maybe we like listening to podcasts. Hopefully we're sharing some good tips here. Or maybe you like LinkedIn learning courses, or maybe you learn by talking to other people. And that really is because they all have learned that no matter how successful you are, you need to surround yourself with a team of mentors who believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Thank you.